Thanks for being here today. I, um, as I prayed about this passage, not just for today, but in the past, um, I've always found it difficult and I didn't have a good understanding of um, just what happens when believers die. And I could quote all the quick things about to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's really um, taken from this passage that we're going to look at and I'll read it in a few minutes. But my concern was as you would have grieving people who had lost a child or lost a husband or wife, lost a sister or brother, and um, they were ready to put the body in the ground. Um, people tended to weep and to feel they were going to miss that person. And, and there was just this sense of uncertainty. And that, that sense is um, throughout the world, people come up with ways that they're able to explain what happens to a person when they die. And we believe in the resurrection. We know that Jesus rose from the dead, and that's our, um, our hope as well, that, that he has put that into place, and that if we are um, in him at the time that we die, that we, we will rise. But there's something about that still that just seems unfinished. We have scriptures, like the one we're going to read today, that make that seem instant that make it seem as though we get a new body right away. And then we have people who will say, oh no, there's some kind of intermediate state where you're, you're just like a bodiless soul, you know, wandering around and yes, you'll be with the Lord, but you won't be what you're going to be. And, and then people will argue, well, Moses and Elijah, you know, on the Mount of Transfiguration had bodies that were recognizable. So what is that about? And, we have people who take this into all kinds of heresy, like reincarnation and all kinds of garbage. And I just hope today that when we're done looking at this passage, that, um, that we will have clear thinking on this issue and see that the Apostle Paul started out, for we know. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, he isn't guessing. He isn't wondering. He isn't unsure. He says, for we know. And remember that Paul got his information directly from Jesus. Jesus um, spent time with him. He called him out specially, not because Paul was such a great guy. He was actually a criminal. He'd killed people. He was, he was fighting the name of Christ. And we don't know why God chooses some people and not others. We don't know if it's something he just foreknew about Paul that he knew if he gave him a chance, he would turn around, probably. But we do know that Paul didn't go through intermediaries, but he got the information. When Paul says, for we know, he's saying, without a doubt, this is what we know. Verse 1, for we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Now, you might say, as you think about this, you know, Paul was a tent maker. A tent was a, a good um, word picture for him to use. He knew how temporary the tents were that he provided. Um, and if you've ever, like, camped out in a tent or spent some time in a tent, I've known people who lived in a tent or a camper, practically a tent, um, while they built their house. You know, they wanted to... Um, sell the first house or they didn't have the funds or whatever and they lived in a temporary dwelling while they built their house it wasn't fun you know it wasn't if a big storm comes up you don't have much um, protection but paul knew exactly what he was saying when he was comparing this earthly body to a tent and i think the most important part about it is that it's temporary it's not meant to be the body that we carry into eternity because he says he knows, we know that we, um, when our earthly home is destroyed, and he's not talking about the house that you live in, he's talking about your body, the home of your spirit, the home of your soul, who you are, when that's destroyed, that we will have a building from God, a house not made with hands. Now you might say, well, we're all um, created by God, and we are, but we're created by God 
through process that God set in place. And we understand the process of conception and birth. And really, each baby is not instantly created by God as Adam and Eve were. We know that they were created adults. They were never babies. God can create people, but the way he has done it in our um, understanding to this point has usually been um, through a process. So we, we see in that that he's saying we're going to have a, a tent, a new body, not created with hands, nothing to do with something we or other humans do, but something God does. Verse 2, for in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. Now, think about that. I mentioned to you before that some people believe that because, you know, People go exhume bodies for whatever reason. Something was forgotten or a crime was committed or whatever. The body's still in the ground, isn't it? It's, it hasn't been resurrected yet. It's still there. But yet the person has passed. And we know that one day there will be a resurrection. We're taught that, that the bodies will come up out of the ground and it'll be kind of amazing. The dead in Christ will rise. And so... Think in your mind, I'd like you to just get an idea. So how do you justify that in your mind? What do you think happens when, when someone dies, they go immediately to be with the Lord, they're cremated or they're eaten by sharks or they're buried in a vault and a thing. You know, we have people who try whatever they can to preserve their bodies these days. You can pay to have your body like cold storage, frozen, so that if some amazing thing comes up, a scientist invents a cure for old age, I guess, or whatever whatever condition you had. And if, if that comes about, people who are wealthy often preserve their bodies thinking, you know, they'll bring me back. Those are people who don't believe that, that we're going to be resurrected in Jesus. But, but you know that people struggle with this idea and they wonder about it. It concerns people who are are ready to pass from this life sometimes. Just wondering, like, they have all those stories that all the preachers and pastors and storytellers and all the things I've read, are those really true? Is this really going to work out, God? You're really going to take care of me? We know that there are um, people who um, have what they call um, experiences, I guess I'll just say, where they believe they have died and they believe they have gone to heaven or they have gone to hell or something else happened and they tell their story and and there's not um there's not any backup for that in scripture that that happens and very often those people are sincerely wrong that that they have gone to heaven and come back that's not the way god does that and often their stories are compelling and heart-wrenching and and they get special word from from some angel or someone. And I just want to remind you that there are a third of the angels, very um, higher than us beings, with powers different than human powers. They're people who should be serving God, and God has those um, good angels serving us, the saints. But there are a third of them out there just doing bad stuff tricking people, making them believe stuff that is not true, creating experiences for people that are not godly experiences. I don't believe as a, as a believer, as a someone who's calling Jesus Lord, that you have to worry about that happening to you. But you can be tricked by a story. People can take, tell a really good story. You have to be careful and think, well, what does God's word say about that? Verse 4 um, so I, I was going to say about three, sorry, let me back up a minute, that he says, by putting on this body, we may not be found naked. Paul is saying, we're not going to be in an intermediate state where you're floating around as a little soul out there without a body. That's not going to happen. That's what he's saying. Verse four, for while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, we're not asking to die, but that we would be further clothed so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. And Paul, in his saying, we know, 
is saying, um, as he has elsewhere, he's willing to do whatever it is that God wants him to do. If in one of these times that he's being beaten or stoned or shipwrecked or all the things that happened to him, if his life is gone, good, he'll be with the Lord. But as long as God wants him here, he's also happy to just continue um, to be in this body, but that sometimes we groan. Sometimes we groan in pain, physical pain. Um, I recently had to stop taking ibuprofen <laughs> for my arthritis pain, and the doctor made me stop it abruptly. And I'll just tell you, I groan when I get up in the morning. I, I hesitate to put that foot out of bed because it hurts so much, and I'm trusting God to see me through that. I have not taken ibuprofen for two weeks. And I'm living here. I'm still here. I'm not, I don't, you know, but it's bad. Anyway, but sometimes we groan. Sometimes it's because of physical pain or disability or, or tiredness or whatever. Sometimes it's from tiredness of just the, it keeps happening of life. One stressor after another, after another. We just think we're barely getting over one thing and another thing happens. And in this life, in this body, along with Paul, we groan being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. And that means that the, the experience that we have here in this body now will be as though it does not happen, as though it did not happen. It will seem um, momentary and far away, and we won't just think about it all the time one day. But right now, along with Paul, we groan. And, and he says he's looking forward to that new body. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So he's given us the Holy Spirit at salvation. The Holy Spirit comes into us. And Jesus told his disciples, he says, I go away, I prepare a place for you, and, and I'm going to receive you back to myself, but I go away so that the Comforter can come. And I just really encourage you today to welcome the Holy Spirit in your life. You can be indwelled by the Holy Spirit, but not have a fullness of the manifest presence of the Holy Spirit. And we quench the spirit, we push it away, we push it down, we minimize its effect of the Holy Spirit in our life when we ignore holiness, when we ignore the fact that God is a holy God and that really is not going to welcome his presence in our life. This is not about rule keeping, it's about submission to God and saying, just as the song Jean led us in, as I was thinking about that song, and I knew it was in the lineup, I, I recognized that there are chains in my life that I needed to just say, God, break every chain. I don't want to hold on to even a chain as small as a hair that just is constantly kind of pulling me back. Break every chain in my life, anything that's in my life that is quenching your spirit, that's not just fanning the flame of your spirit and, and making it be real and, and the only thing that's in my life. And I think we have to do that assessment with the Holy Spirit regularly. It's just a natural thing that's going to happen. And, and just become disciplined about it to ask God, show me the chains. Show me if chains are forming that weren't there before. Show me if there are chains that I wasn't ready to have you break yet for me, but break them, Lord, and I'm willing to live with the consequences. You know, because sometimes we don't break the chains because we really like to sin. We like it. We want to keep doing whatever that is. But the Holy Spirit has been given to us as a guarantee, and it's a guarantee that is ironclad. It's true. It is a guarantee from God to say, what I say in my word is true, and you can count on it. You can count on the Old Testament prophets. You can count on the, um, the words of the gospel writers. You can count on what I showed the Apostle Paul. I have preserved that word on purpose for you, for your instruction, for your support. I recently ran into a lady who said she had been 
in a church a believer for a very long time, but did not love to read the Bible. She liked to come to church and have someone tell her what it meant, but she did not have a love of reading the Bible. That was almost like a foreign concept to her. And because of events in her life, she realized someone in her family had to get serious with God, and she guessed it would be her. And as she did that, at I think she said 45, she grew to love the Word of God. It was as though there was not enough time to read the Bible in her life. She loved it. She could not be satisfied. And I just pray that for each of you today. I pray that your schedule is messed up. I pray that you forget things. I pray that you don't get things that are of this world done because you love the Word of God so much you lose track of time as you read it. Because God has given us His Word as a way to show us who he is, as a way to not just keep repeating himself and giving verbal messages to you, here I am, you know. He, he revealed himself to Abraham as I am. Now, if you think about that, that's talking about his presence. But we also know that God is eternally existent in the past and in the future. Um, it's like that number infinity. Remember in math when you learned about infinity and if you take one away from infinity, you still have infinity. It, it, it just, it doesn't change the number. Well, that eternalness of God, there's nothing you can do to change the number. It's not going to get greater. It's not going to get less. He's eternal, always existent. We know that Jesus was slain, that's talking about his time on the cross, before the foundation of the world, before the earth was created, before anything happened, he was slain. Now think about that. Some people say, well, that shows that it was just a setup, that God knew Adam and Eve couldn't keep the rules and they were going to need a savior. We're going to talk about that a little more. I don't believe that is what that means, but just keep that thought in mind. This guarantee that we have of the Holy Spirit is something that we we believe by faith. It's something that as you trust in God, that he really has given his Holy Spirit, as you trust him and ask for more, as you ask for the baptism in the Holy Spirit, we do that by faith, not because anyone can touch it or show us something other than God's promise that's that true. And, and it's on purpose that way, because it grows our faith as we trust that what God said is true, as we live our life like we really believe what he said is true, our faith increases. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Impossible. We learned that in Hebrews, remember? So it's not as though you can squeak by and be pleasing God if you're living your life with what you can control, with what you can see, with what you can do, with what you can handle, with the amount of risk you're willing to take, you are not showing faith in God. And he stretches us in our faith as we believe he gives us more faith. We all have enough faith for salvation. He gives us that, that mustard seed size faith to believe. But beyond that, we have to exercise the faith in order for it to grow. Six, so we are always of good courage. I wish I could say that. That was always of good courage. Good courage, not falsely placed courage. We're always of good courage. We're uplifted. Paul says we're always of good courage. We know that while we're at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. And that's part of that holiness thing. If you think about as you live your life, as you pay your bills, as you feed your dog, as you mow your grass, as you do your life, make it your goal to please him. Whatever it is that you do, um, offer it up to God and say, let me do this in a way that is pleasing to you, God. If you need to teach me a lesson through this, I'm ready for the lesson. Show me, God. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. 
Now, this, there's a fear factor here. If there wasn't, you're not really listening. If it doesn't feel fearful to you, and we often make a big deal about fearing God doesn't mean we're afraid of him. It means we respect him. But really, we should fear him. <laughs> we really should. Um, we are like ants. We're just almost inconsequential, except for he loves us. We have nothing to, to just um, show for ourselves. No amount of wonderfulness that you think you are is worth the love that God extends to us so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Now, this used to bug me. I used to think, huh, so that means everything that we do in life, um, you know, the Bible says that one day all things will be known. That doesn't mean um, every little dirty secret that you've had will be known to everyone. I've been taught that before, but I don't believe that's true necessarily. I believe the people that are of consequence that it matters to will know it. But we will not have um, um, shame or reason to think I'm better than you or wow, she did that? That's not gonna be part of heaven. But the point is that we are all going to be judged. You cannot live your life as a Christian perfectly enough so that you will not be judged. You'll be judged for what you were given and what you did with that, for what you were shown. And did you share that or did you sit on it? Like my secret, I know this, but I'm not telling anybody else. They might laugh at me. We'll be shown um, what we could have done with our life as compared to what we did with our life. Now, I told you that this has been uh, just something that has uh, it's been a prayer of mine, I'm going to say, for 30 years. And I've been concerned about the idea. I don't want at a funeral to give someone false hope. When someone says, where is my mom now? You know, is my mom there in the casket? Is my, you know, and if I give them that little standard that came from the passage we just read, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But how does that really work? It, it sort of almost seems like I'm patting them on the head, like, don't worry, we just trust God about that. But Paul said, we know the body that we receive is somehow present immediately, but also is taken into account in passages about the resurrection. It just, it, it just feels icky. And as I've been studying this, I realized something that I've known always, but I didn't connect here, is that we live in time. Our life is linear. It just keeps tracking out as we do it. All people live in time. There was an event in history where Jesus died on a cross. There was an event in history, in time, where Jesus came as a baby. There will be an event in time where people are raised from the dead. Jesus comes back. But time does not equal eternity. The event of the cross was such a um, far-reaching event that it was in both time. You could put the date down. I don't know if anyone has quite figured out the exact date. We know approximately. And if people had been keeping track, they could have written down the date and the hour, and they'd know in time this happened. But that event was also in eternity. We know that because what I told you, the lamb was slain before the world was created. The lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. And God is saying through that, that in eternity, time is not linear. We do not stamp it out day after day, another month, another year. In eternity, there is no time. There's present, always present. So when you die, body's there, you go to be with the Lord, you get your eternal resurrected, whatever you want to call it, body at that point. Your old body, if it's cremated, if it's eaten by sharks, if it's in a casket, wherever it is, stays until the resurrection. 
but you get your body right then. You don't waft around as a, a little intermediate state spirit. You don't soul sleep, as some people say in your grave. That's not what Paul is telling us. And as you think about that, think about things like that you know as well as I do, your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That means when you give your life to Jesus in eternity, you are already there. Because of sin, we, we are not there. We're still here in time. But it's as though it's already done. You have that guarantee it's already done. And, and you can choose to break the guarantee, but God doesn't break it. You choose to break it. In eternity, when my dad went to be with the Lord, he sees the people that are going to be there one day, already there. He's not missing me. It's like I'm already there. In eternity, it's a done deal. You're already there. He, not my dad now, but God, God sees the beginning from the end. And his knowing is a creating knowing. God speaks a word like your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. It's done. There's no wondering about it. There's no waffling about it. It's done. Paul is saying in a comforting way to help people understand that we don't need to worry about running around naked, that we know that the body God creates will be good, that will be eternal. It's not like a fleshly body. It will still look like you. People will know you. You will be known. I'm not saying that, that he's going to give you a different color hair, or I don't know, maybe we'll have blue hair. But it's not about that, but it's the idea that the body will be sinless. Remember when Jesus came back and Thomas said, unless I see those nail prints, I am not going to believe. Unless I see where that sword went in his side, I am not going to believe. I don't believe you guys. I think you're making this up. Well, now think about it. Jesus had a perfect resurrected body with scars. And I've always kind of wondered about that. Like I knew, well, God left him there on purpose for people like Thomas. But it also shows us that Jesus, when he was here as a baby, as an adult on the cross, when he was here, he never left eternity. He was in time and eternity. God was still on the throne. Jesus, God. And people tr have trouble with that. Like, well, Jesus limited himself, you know, and who was taking care of the world while he was doing that? Some people struggle with that idea, and I'm not saying that it's simple for me, but I believe that God is showing us that it's so far beyond what our ability to see but time and eternity are true. They're concepts in Scripture. We can see in the Old Testament, before Jesus came to earth as a baby and grew to be a man, there are spots in time where the angel of the Lord appeared. And, and that word, Elohim, that's, that's translated that, is because the people who are translating it we're believing that God is in heaven and he sent the angel messenger. But there are times, if you look at it, when Gideon was, was worried, you know, he was out making grain, threshing grain in a wine press because he was so worried that the enemy nations would come in and steal his grain. And they did that every time. They were just impoverishing the nation of Israel. And the angel of the Lord shows up and he speaks to Gideon as God. Gideon answers to him as God. It's a pre-incarnate um, visit from Jesus. And God has always been able to be in eternity and time. In the last days, he has given us the special indwelling of his Holy Spirit for us always. And I think that we don't always take that into account. We don't even realize what an amazing thing that is, that each believer is indwelled by the Holy Spirit. It's the guarantee that what God says is true, and we don't have to worry about it. 
And maybe you weren't worrying about it. Maybe it didn't bother you. You know, where is your body in between now when you die in the resurrection? Paul says elsewhere that he would really prefer to go up in the rapture. He didn't really want to die. He, you know, those people are the, have the best deal. Really, you all have the best deal. <laughs> Whenever you die, it is going to be an eternity as though in the present, right there, it happens. And everything, all the promises of God come to you right then, as well as the judgment. So there will be a time in time where we have judgment, last day, day of the Lord. Everybody gets what's coming to them. Some people are, are sent you know, to eternal punishment. Some people have eternal life in God. I'm not saying those things don't happen, but for the believer, when you die, you get it all. You get it all right there. You experience just as though you were taken in the rapture, just as though you're immediately taken into the presence of the Lord. You immediately know your judgment. God lets you see what it is you could have done, what it is you did, and you go on from there. There is no regret. There is no shame. There is no, oh my, wish I had done better. But it does help you to see who God is and who God is to you to believe. And I encourage you to decrease the regret. <laughs> Do what you can today to let the Holy Spirit break those chains. Do what you can and look forward, however it is that you go, whether in the rapture or whether you die in your body or whether you're taken out by a car accident, however that is, look forward to it. It is not something that really, I, people nowadays are doing these celebrations of life. And sometimes I think, but people are really sad. They need some time to grieve. Do we really have to pretend we're happy when we're not happy? Well, if it's not a believer, I'm not so sure it should be a celebration of life. That's a very serious event. Um, we have no more chance to meet the goal of eternity when time in this life is done. When it's done, no more chance. And so think about that when you just think, well, I'll get to telling my grandson someday. I want to make sure he knows about Jesus. Realize that none of us have a guaranteed amount of time here in life. We don't know when time will end for us or for another person. Maybe you're the one that needs, would have the most influence to witness to someone in your life, and maybe your life will be cut short. Maybe their life will be shorter than we anticipate. God knows. No one's life is ever cut short. God knows just he's ordered our days. He knows how many days we will have. It's already set in eternity. God does not make some people unable to ever respond to him, though. God is not willing that anyone should perish. He wants everyone to have eternal life. God doesn't have favorites where he makes sure this guy gets enough information, but that one, eh, not so important. God is extending himself through Jesus, and Jesus' death on the cross in eternity, not just time, his death on the cross is an ever-present event in eternity. It's, it's just there. It's one reason that it is so powerful. It has not been forgotten about, not just in time. It will never be forgotten in eternity. It changed everything for everyone always. So as we witness to the cross, as we recognize that, not just as an event in the past and time, but as a powerful, life-changing event, Jesus' death and resurrection changes everything. Have faith in that. That's what God told us. That's the truth of the gospel. And if we're afraid to share the gospel, it's because we're not sure it will work. It will work. It works. It's true. It really is true. And put your faith in God's wanting to have no one um, go out into eternity without him.
God cares. He cares about you. He cares about your family. He cares about the things that you're going through. Some of the things that you're going through, if you would pray, he would relieve. Some of them he would embrace and say, my strength is sufficient for you. This is on purpose. But don't forget to pray. Don't forget to, to speak. Don't forget to tell the gospel. It has power.